Let's listen. This is the Senate Intelligence Committee giving an update. The elections. And uh, let me just say that we can't say enough what the mission of uh, the Senate committee is, which is to look at all activities that Russia might have taken to alter or influence the 2016 elections in the United States. In addition to that, uh, the mission of the committee is to look at any campaign contacts from either committee with Russian government or Russian government officials that might have uh, influenced in any way, shape, or form uh, the election process. We take that very seriously. It's not something that can be done quickly. And when you look at uh, our committee, uh, it is, in fact, the oversight role that we function in every single day. This is just on a little larger scale. For those that might think or have suggested that this is outside of our expertise, let me remind you, uh, the last public investigation that we did was the Senate investigation into Benghazi. We devoted three professional staff to that investigation. It took one year. And in comparison to the public hearings that happened in the House, our report and findings were out much quicker than what they were, and I think are consistent with, in fact, what the House process looked like at the end. So let me share with you what we've accomplished to date. We have devoted seven professional staff positions to this investigation. These are staffers who already had the clearance and already had the knowledge of the materials that they were going to look at that started on day one. Now, what was day one? Day one was the first public hearing that the committee held with Director Clapper, Director Comey, Admiral Rogers, and Director Brennan when they came to uh, the United States Senate to testify on the completion of the ICA. Uh, the, the, the report of the last administration on Russia's involvement in the elections. The full committee had an opportunity to ask every one of the four IC members uh, initial questions, things that we knew to ask as of that time. Let me assure you that as this investigation continues, we will certainly give those individuals at least once, if not more, opportunities to come back, either in official capacity or in a retired capacity to come back and share with us answers to questions we might have. The staff has been provided an unprecedented amount of documents. Those documents include documents that up to this point have only been shared with the gang of eight and staff directors on the House and Senate side. It's safe to say that our staff currently is working through thousands of raw intelligence and analytic products to, one, determine whether the process that the reviewers went through to compile their report we're in agreement with, with and to see if our confidence levels on their ratings of low, medium, or high confidence, in fact, match. To date, as I said, they've been provided thousands of pages of documents and have reviewed, to date, a majority of those documents. We're within weeks of completing the review of those documents. I might say that we're in constant negotiations with the intelligence community about access to additional documents, to where we access those documents, to how our staff notes are kept, and whether, in fact, we have the capabilities within the intelligence community spaces to use computers. This is not abnormal. It's been involved in every investigation I've seen in the 17 years I've been on either the House or the Senate committee. So I don't find this to be unusual, but it is challenging, to say the least. It does not yet include the additional documents that the committee has requested and others that we will request to enable us ultimately to come to some finality findings and conclusions of the mission of this investigation. This week, we began to schedule our first interviews. To date, 
We have made 20 requests for individuals to be interviewed by the committee. As we stand here today, five are already scheduled on the books, and probably within the next 10 days, the remaining 15 will have a scheduled date for those individuals to be interviewed by our staff. We anticipate inviting additional individuals to come and be interviewed, and ultimately some of those interviewed individuals may turn into uh, private and public hearings by the committee, but yet to be determined. There have been a number of individuals who have volunteered to be interviewed. Let me assure you that they will be processed as the committee determines we're ready to conduct those interviews, or if they're even pertinent to the issues that we need to look into. The only individual who's publicly been identified to date is Jared Kushner. And the committee will conduct an interview with Mr. Kushner when the committee decides that it's time for us to set a date because we know exactly the scope of what needs to be asked of Mr. Kushner. Tomorrow's hearing, which will be the first public hearing that we've held, is to examine Russian capabilities their capabilities to influence elections globally, what Russia has done in the past, which is important for us to bring to light for the American people, what they're doing today both here and throughout the world, and more importantly, what we should expect for the future. Uh, we've got two panels, uh, two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, to look at specifically the policies that uh, we think uh, uh, Russia is uh, implementing and to look at the technologies that display their capabilities. I would conclude with this and then I'll turn it over to Mark. Uh, we will always say to you this investigation scope will go wherever the intelligence leads it. So it is absolutely crucial that every day we spend trying to separate fact from fiction and to find some intelligence thread that sends us to the factual side of all the names and all the places that you in this room have written about. Just the fact that you say it doesn't mean it's fact. It's incumbent on our staff and on our members to in fact connect that intelligence thread to that for us to make some determination as to the relevance of it in our investigation. So Mark and I work hand in hand on this and uh, contrary to uh, uh, maybe popular belief, uh, we're, we're partners to see that this is uh, completed and that we've got uh, a product at the end of the day that we can have bipartisanship in supporting. Mark? Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Um, let me, I'm going to repeat many of, the thing, many of the things the chairman have said, but I think it's important that you hear it from both of us. Obviously, there's a lot of drama out there that about the stories that all of you are running down, and I think echoing what the chairman has said, it's important for us at least, and I think all of us here, to remember to not lose sight about what this investigation is about. An outside foreign adversary effectively sought to hijack our most critical democratic process, the election of a president. And in that process, decided to favor one candidate over another. I can assure you, they didn't do it because it was in the best interest of the American people. Russia's goal, Vladimir Putin's goal, is a weaker United States, weaker economically, weaker globally, and that should be a concern to all Americans, regardless of party affiliation. We're here to assure you and more importantly, the American people who are watching and listening, that we will get to the bottom of this. Richard and I have known each other a long time. And the chairman and I both have a serious concern about what the Russians have done and continue to do around the world. And I'll come back to this in a moment when we talk about tomorrow's hearing. But some of the techniques that Russia used in this election, as we find more and more, I think, would send a chill down anyone who believes in a democratic process in this country 
or around the world. And echoing what the chairman has said, the committee will follow the intelligence wherever it leads. We need to get this right. And sometimes that means, especially for somebody like me, who uh, wants things done yesterday, that it's not going to happen as quickly as I would like or many members of our committee would like. But getting it right is more important than getting it done quickly. And I want to echo, again, something the chairman has said. What I've been remarkably proud of is that the committee on both sides of the aisle, virtually every member, the level of seriousness that they put into this work, the attention that they've given, and the commitment as well to follow the intel wherever we lead. I'm going to echo again a little bit about what the chairman has already said. Over the last month, we've seen some progress. Our staffs have been out reviewing these thousands of pages of documents, trying to look back at the source materials. We also, as the chairman has mentioned, are starting to talk to some of those analysts who helped put together this report. And in many ways, we want to find out what was potentially left on the cutting room floor that might not have met the full levels of, of confidence, uh, but still might be worthy of further looking. And as the chairman mentioned, a number of those interviews are scheduled. The intelligence community, for the most part, uh, in terms of access to people, has been very cooperative. On some of the documents, with some parts of the intelligence community, we still have a challenge. But we cannot do this job. We cannot tell the American people our conclusions unless we have access to all the pertinent information. And one of the things that I really appreciate is that the chairman and I are committed to getting that. And I know that the patriots that work in the intelligence community want us as well to go wherever the facts lead. As has been mentioned, the only person that we've announced is Jared Kushner. And we will schedule that again when we have the facts so we can ask the appropriate questions. As also Richard said, there's a lot of names. Uh, chairman's mentioned some of the folks like Carter Page or Paul Manafort or Roger Stone. We've indicated there will be appropriate time, but it's got to be done in a timely way so that any individual, those and others, and there will be others, with the, we have the right questions to ask. Tomorrow's hearing, as the chairman mentioned, will be the first in a series. Um, I think it will be interesting because some of the techniques uh, which the Russians used in this past election uh, really go to the heart of how our democratic process works. I was a technology guy before I was in politics. And the very technology that has made our lives simpler can also be misused in ways to put false information for folks who potentially only get their news off a Twitter feed or a Facebook news feed. And that raises serious questions even beyond this investigation. So with that, I again want to thank uh, the chairman for the cooperation we've had. Uh, and I think I speak on behalf of all the committee members. You know, most important thing we want to let you know is we're going to get this right and we're going to follow all the intelligence. Happy to take your questions. Yeah, we'll, we'll take some questions. Let me just let me set the ground rules real quick. We'll answer anything about the Senate Intelligence <laughs> Committee's investigation. We will not take questions on the House Intelligence Committee. We would refer those to the House Intelligence Committee. <laughs> no. the, the White House is continually said that any discussion about coordination between the Trump campaign and Russian officials is a hoax. Anybody who's seen any information about this knows that there's nothing there. So from what you have seen so far, can you definitively rule out that there was no coordination whatsoever between Trump officials and Russian officials during the election? You know, it would be crazy to try to draw conclusions from where we are in the investigation. I think Mark and I have uh, committed to let this process go through before we uh, form any opinions. And I would hope that that's what you would like us to do. As much as we'd like to share minute by minute, even the snapshots we get as a, as a team going through it are not always accurate when we find the next piece of intelligence. So let us get a little deeper into this before you ask us to write the conclusions. Uh, that's clearly something we intend to do down the road. Chairman? All the Senator, way in the back real quick. Sir, Senator Wyden today sent a letter to both you and Senator Warner uh, urging the committee to look closer at the financial ties between Trump associates and uh, Russia. 
is, is there a sense that the committee is not already investigating the financial aspect of this closely enough? Or I think the, commi the, committee, the committee the the committee's looking anywhere intelligence suggests that there might have been uh, any type of uh, re relationship or effort to influence U.S. elections. And I, and I just simply add that, you know, I, for a long time before we even started the investigation, have believed that this president, like all prior presidential candidates of both parties, should have, in the best interest of the American people, released their tax returns. So, Chairman, uh, is Christopher Steele among the 20 that you've identified? And if necessary, does your committee have the reach and the resources to interview persons outside the United States, if you deem that? Well, we're not going to get into names that are on our list, but I can assure you that it's, that it's lengthy. Um, Mark and I have both agreed that we're willing to issue subpoenas. It's tough to make a subpoena go outside of the United States, so we understand the limitations. But um, I, I, I'll only say this, that he and I are tapping into everything that we can to understand how we increase our reach in the ability to investigate and to get intelligence that would be pertinent to the investigation. Senator Burke, have you, have you personally coordinated with the White House at all on the scope of this investigation? And how do you prevent it from going off track? No, sir, I have not. And um, it's the relationship and the trust we have. And let me also add, let me just also add to that. Um, there have been all the members of the committee. I have been constantly impressed. You know, and I, we know it's challenging. Some folks want this to go away. Some folks want this to be done and us reaching conclusions to, to, tomorrow or yesterday. Uh, but so many committee members on both sides of the aisle have constantly stepped up. So it, I think it's not only our relationship, but it's the fact that the committee, I think, has, has got our back and they want to see it through. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Without naming another committee, could you speak to the level of satisfaction on both sides of the aisle within your com committee about the integrity of the committee, how it's working, its functions, and so on? Well, I think the, the first assessment I would make is that not only for the first time have our members had um, access to Gang of Eight information, seven of our professional staff slots have access to Gang of Eight information. That is unprecedented in the history of the committee. And uh, so I think it starts with the trust that the intelligence community has with the staff, the professional staff, and with the membership at large. It would be extremely easy for them to deny us to, to have access to some of the country's most sensitive things that deal with sources and methods. They have not. And I think that's what gives us high hopes that we can reach a conclusion that has bipartisan support and that we feel confident explored every crevice that we can find. We are going to need to make sure we get all that information. I mean, you know, part of this is the normal course, I think, of the intelligence community having concerns, and I think we've earned their trust, but it continues this back and forth. Senators, uh, the uh, two-pronged question. Uh, uh, one is that uh, Paul Manafort has written to the committee, and I understand his lawyers have been talking to your staff to try to set up his interview. Can you tell us whether that has happened already? And secondly, just from a logistical standpoint, we're hearing uh, that you know people on your committee who go and read some of these documents uh, at the CIA, for instance, it, it's a bewildering amount of, of information, and they don't even know where to begin, where it ends. Uh, is there something being done to try to help you get through this, uh, this this volume of large volume of information. Listen, uh, I'm not sure who, you, who you're hearing it from. It's not the professional staff that's doing it. Is it a lot of information? Absolutely. Uh, is it is it clear to know where to go? Yeah, it's in it's in three binders. You open the front cover and you start reading until you get to the back one, and then you work on the second and the third. Um, in Benghazi, our professional staff had to go out and figure out what intelligence they needed to ask for, didn't have access to Gang of Eight, had to figure out who to interview. And uh, so I'm not going to tell you this one's easier. This one's, this one's one of the biggest investigations that the Hill has seen in my tenure here. And just to add, you know, the challenge at times is then you go to a footnote and you've got to then go back and get a document that supports that footnote. So again, we want to do, you mentioned one individual, any of those individuals that are out in the public, <coughs> We'll have to assess whether it's appropriate to see him, and you might think it will be appropriate. But we've got to get our—we got to know what the right questions are to ask, and to do that, you've got to have the underlying document. So that's not scheduled yet. Not scheduled. Chair, 
Senator Warner, in your remarks, you mentioned there are still challenges getting information from the IC. Are there particular agencies in particular that are moving slowly? I'm, I'm, you well, know, I, I knew you were you were going to ask that, and I'm going to not say, but I want to make sure the intelligence community knows some have been very responsive, some less so. But to do our job, we have to have this this information. And let me answer. Let me answer on behalf of the agencies. Not every document that an agency holds is the is the product of that agency. So it is impossible from a legal standpoint for one agency to provide us another agency's document. So the, the faster we can work through who has ownership uh, rights, the quicker we can ask the appropriate agency for a specific Mr. document. Chairman, Let me go right here. As part of your investigation, are you asking the House Chairman to share his sources with you? And will you seek to review the White House visitor logs? We're, 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 we're not asking the House to play any role in our investigation. We don't plan to play any role in their investigation. For Senator Warner, are you confident that the White House has not interfered in the integrity of this investigation? And for both of you, is the ultimate aim to write a bipartisan report at the end of this investigation? Let me, let me start with the second part of your question. Absolutely, in terms of bipartisan. If we don't come to some joint conclusion with the manipulation that took place in the election and with the spirit of kind of the American people saying, what's going on here? Uh, I think we would not fulfill our duty. Um, on the first question, I've seen no evidence. I, you know, I think one of the things that Mr. Kushner uh, volunteering to testify was a good sign. But you know, I've said repeatedly, and I think the, the chairman agrees, you know, this is the right venue. But if we see any attempt to stifle us with information, or cut off the intelligence professionals giving us the access we need, uh, you'll hear from us. Down here. Um, David Smith of The Garden. Can I ask, um, will you also be looking at the potential rewards Russia got for this, whether it's questions of changes to the Republican Party platform at the convention, or the way the president constantly refuses to criticize Vladimir Putin? Is, is that part of what you're looking at? Well, uh, that's not in the scope of the investigation. I'll leave that up to you guys to report. Yes, ma'am. Um, has the White House or the DOJ or any part of the Trump administration blocked Sally Yates from uh, giving you guys information or coming before the committee? I'd like to see Ms. Yates at some point. I did see her White House comment from the White House spokesman yesterday that you know, she, he said that they'd be happy to have her testify. I know there may be some DOJ concerns, but again, that's something we have to jointly decide on when the schedule would take place. So they haven't blocked her from being or giving, enabling her to come up before your committee or to talk to you? No. Mr. Chairman, Senator Byrd. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of Americans want to know if the president himself had anything to do with this. I mean, we have a we have a government there's a trust issue right now. A lot of Americans. Is there anything that you've seen to either of you or your staff that would raise any direct? links to the president himself to what happened last year. Again, we won't take a snapshot in time and uh, make any observations on it, but we know that our challenge is to answer that question for the American people in our conclusions to this investigation. Senator Burke, is there any circumstance with which you wouldn't share with Mr. Warner, one of your sources of intelligence on this investigation? He usually knows my sources before I do. Mm -hmm. And he, let me assure you, I've also got his cell phone, which is, <laughs> means he hears from me more than he sometimes like. Uh, the White House and, and supporters of the president have complained at times that uh, the intelligence community has leaked intelligence or communications scooped up by members of the by Trump associates or members of the transition team improperly. Does the scope of your investigation include any of that? The, the, the normal course of business for the Intelligence Committee um, is about leaks. So uh, that's an ongoing process that we look at. Uh, we will try to assess leaks if they take place during the investigation in the same way. And if we find them, we will refer them to the appropriate law enforcement agency um, by requesting a crimes report. Have you seen anything yet that would suggest the intelligence community did anything improper with information that it collected that had to do with? I, my, my answer would probably be no, but uh, you know we're so early in the investigation. I'm not sure that we've triaged every piece that's yeah, out there. And I, I think we. One of the things we both are very concerned because leaks can sometimes 
be extraordinarily damaging to our, our capacity and to the, the men and women who serve our country in the IC. Um, I do think that, uh, editorial comment here, uh, that if the administration has said they did nothing, then I would hope they would continue. There's nothing to leak, but on the other hand, the more cooperation we can get, the sooner we can move forward and we get to the end of when we move this cloud. Senator. Senator. The, uh, so the fact that the FBI has an active counterintelligence investigation, has that caused you to change your investigation at all in terms of trying not to, to step on their toes or to do anything that could undermine a potential criminal investigation? I'll leave up to the FBI to make any comments on uh, a CI investigation if there is one and the extent. But we're always conscious of the fact that we may go down a road and find that we're in conflict with a, a law enforcement uh, uh, a process, at, at which time we will work with uh, the appropriate people to try to remedy that. But there is historical precedent, obviously. Yeah. Watergate had an investigation while there were DOJ investigations going on, but we're very sensitive to <clears> it. <throat> Senator Warner, can you give us a sense of the scale of what the Russians allegedly did in terms of the numbers of people and the different facets of the attack? Uh, I'd like to, let me start off on that. I, I think we know about the hacking and the selective leaking of information. But as a former tech guy, what really concerns me is at least some reports, and we've got to get to the bottom of this, that there were upwards of a thousand paid internet trolls working out of a facility in Russia, in effect taking over a series of computers which are then called a botnet. They can then generate news down to specific areas. It's been reported to me, and we've got to find this out, whether they were able to, in effect, specific areas in Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, where you would not have been receiving off of your, your whoever your vendor might have been, Trump versus Clinton during the waning days of the election. But instead, Clinton is sick, or Clinton is taking money from, from uh, some source. Fake news. We've also seen as well um, the fact that if you think about, if you look, just at, for example, if you Google election hacking during the period leading up to the, uh, the election and immediate afterwards, you wouldn't get Fox or ABC or New York Times. Or, uh, what you get is four out of the first five news stories that popped up were Russian propaganda. RT News, Sputnik, others. And again, let's be clear, I'm not here to relitigate the election. But the fact we have, I believe, part of our responsibility as well is to put the American public on a higher level of alert <coughs> that this time it was Russia, it could be other foreign nations as well. We are in a whole new realm around cyber that pr provides opportunities, but huge, huge threats for basic democracy. And we're seeing it right now in France. And, and, and we're on the brink of potentially having two European countries where Russia is the balance uh, disruptor of uh, their their leadership. And what we might assess as a very covert effort in 2016 in the United States is a very overt effort as well as covert in uh, Germany and France, yep. already been tried in Montenegro and Netherlands. And uh, so we, we feel part of our responsibility is to educate the rest of the world about what's going on because it's now into character assassination of candidates. And one of the things that we, I think, as the committee working with the administration, you know, how we really think proactively about what kind of even potentially offensive strategy you have to take, we cannot allow this to happen again. And this last time it maybe favored one party, it could favor, you know, Russia's going to act in its self interest, not in America's interest. And so we have to be careful in 2018 and obviously in 2020. Senator Burr. Thank you, Senator. Mary Louise Kelly, NPR. A question for you, Senator Burr, and I ask this with no disrespect, but because it's a question that's hung He disrespects me all the time. <laughs> Having served as an advisor on the Trump campaign, can you say hand over heart that you can oversee an impartial and serious investigation? Absolutely. I'll, I'll, the I'll do something I've never done. I'll admit that I voted for him. Um, yeah, we always hide who we vote for. Uh, that, that's part of the democratic process. But I've got a job in the United States Senate. And I take that job extremely serious. It overrides any personal beliefs that I have or loyalties that I might have. 
um, Mark and I might look at politics differently. We don't look at the responsibilities we have on the committee differently, and that's to earn the trust and the respect of the intelligence community so they feel open and good about sharing information with us because that enables us to do our oversight job that much better. And let me just, let me just think that. I have confidence in Richard Byrd that we, together, with the members of our committee, are going to get to the bottom of this. And that's, if you get nothing else from today, take that statement to the bank. Have you guys been in contact with Michael Flynn or had, you know, representatives of Michael Flynn? And also, can you go into a little bit of the, the thought process between why you would have an invest, or a interview behind closed doors or do it publicly, like why you would talk to Jared Kushner behind closed doors or you would do it publicly, why you would do that? Well, um, I think it's safe to say that we have had conversations with a lot of people. And uh, you would think less of us if, if General Flynn wasn't in that list. From a standpoint of the interview process, if you feel like you're being cheated uh, because they're not in public, if there's relevance to them, they will eventually be part of a public hearing. Um, but any uh, investigation of this kind We'll start with private interviews to determine the value of what a, a witness uh, has to provide for the committee. One thing that we're really conscious of is we weren't given a free pass to do a witch hunt. Uh, we were asked to do a real investigation. And we'll see high profile people and we will see analysts from the intelligence community. Um, or we may see a 28-year-old that happened to answer the phone at the White House on the wrong day when an ambassador called him and when they went around and said, who talked to the ambassador, they raised their hand. Mark and I don't want that person to have to get a lawyer to be interviewed. Uh, we'd like to bring them up and, and understand what role they played, if any, without any liability that extends to them. So we're really conscious of trying to assess each individual person for what the need is, but we don't rule anything out for anybody relative to how public the information might be. You already spoken to Flynn? Have you already spoken to Flynn? I'm not going to tell you one way or the other. Yes, ma'am. You said that you had requested interviews from 20 people and then scheduled five, but yes. when did those actually start? Did you conduct any of them or when did that start? Of the uh, I think they start as early as next Monday, but I would I, I would probably be the wrong one to verify that. Um, but they're, they're immediate. <laughs> They are immediate. And remember, these are the people who helped put together the January 6th report. Most of those fall into that category. And you know what? When you, see, when you see a movie, it's roughly two hours. When you see how much film went into a movie, it's probably 50 hours. We don't want to just look at what was in the report. We want to look what was cut and thrown on the floor, either an analytic product or an intelligence, to figure out whether an analyst made the right determination with what we know today. What we know today is a lot more than what they knew in December when they went through this process. Senator. Got time for a couple more right here. Um, you said you're looking at uh, communications and connections with uh, people involved with the Russian government. Are you also looking at uh, people involved in organized crime in Russia and their contacts? I don't think we said anything about organized crime. We said anybody that had connections to the Russian government in contact with the campaign. But unfortunately, many people in Russia who are part of an organized crime network seem to have ties to the Russian I'll government. let that one be attributed to him. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. you mentioned a potential or concern for an attack during the 2018 election. So does this investigation need to be completed before then so you can better prevent We sure have, hope so. Tomorrow's, tomorrow's hearing is with specifically that in mind that um, we provide more public awareness, not just in this country, but throughout the world, as to what Russia's up to. Um, I, I think it's safe to say that U.S. officials have pushed what we know, not we the committee, what we the government knows about Russia's capabilities and intent. We've pushed it out to those countries that are most imminent to have elections. But and I remind yeah, you that um, we're within 30 days of the first French election, four candidates. It will go down to two candidates with a runoff in May. Um, I, I think it's safe by everybody's judgment that the Russians are actively involved in the French elections. Okay. Last, last one. Um, you mentioned earlier that your staffers, your professional staffers, have thousands of pages of documents to go through. Are they having to take notes by hand, or is there a similar setup to the Senate um, EIT program where they had sort of a shared drive where they could look at documents online? Um, I, I, 
I'm not going to be specific as to how we're doing it, but there is no shared drive this time around. Uh, that didn't have a happy ending. And uh, so, so we're, we're, again, this gets back to what we said about every iteration is a new negotiation, and we're not complaining about that. We think it's really, really important that we have a clear understanding up front who has access, how do they treat the information that they've got, where do they store the information, who's, who's responsible for the security of that information. Because you, you've, you've got to understand, we're, we're going to go through a, 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 an investigation that will last X amount of time. After that, we've got to perform our oversight job, which means we're going to be working with the same people asking them for documents to do our normal oversight job and if in fact we don't live up to the to the security that we promise them then you're going to have an oversight committee that can't successfully do its job and one of the things we are doing and, and this is where you know, part of the rub comes and we i understand it is that we're basically trying to get access that even goes beyond what the gang of eight has had and in a sense how we have all of that to in terms of raw products and how we make sure that again every committee member has said they've got to see <coughs> or know some of this information before they can sign their name on a finished product so there's some healthy tension there but we believe we'll work for, for any of you that have been at any of the confirmation hearings one question you have heard of every person who was up was nominated and eventually confirmed is would you provide for the committee if asked raw intelligence data. Um, there is rarely a time where a committee would ask for that. We are in a very rare, rare time, and we will test some people to see if, in fact, their commitment is 100% uh, correct. Let me end with uh, how we ended the first part, and that's that the committee will go wherever the intelligence leads us. Um, you can continue to ask us 30 different ways about a person. Trust me, when we have them scheduled, we will tell you. You won't have to beat it out of us. We hope to make uh, updates a periodic thing, but we're not going to do them unless we've got something to share with you that's educational, that shows you a little bit of the roadmap we're going down. It's just uh, right now we're not at a point where we can tell you that's every two weeks or three weeks or, or a month. Uh, we want to do it based upon the changing conditions of the investigation. Last, my last comment is simply a comment I've made before. Um, when we started this, we saw the scope and what was involved. I said it was the most important thing I'd ever taken on in my public life. I believe that more firmly now than even when we started. We're going to get it right. Thank you.